Uh, so today we're going to do some CO and combustion training. Um, so right now, all I can see is my screen. So I don't know if I'm doing something wrong, but um, I'm not going to be able to see those chats. But feel free to unmute yourself um, and shout out a question, or you can save it to the end, or you can email Joan afterwards. Um, but <clears throat> let's just dive into this, because I know all of our lives are getting a lot busier. Um, and start talking about combustion training. Um, so one of the things that I've learned throughout my my time is, is I've always wanted to know the whys of things, right? Like, you know, they always laugh at little kids who say, why, why, why? Well, I'm that adult that still wants to know why. So we're going to start this presentation out about why CO um, and what it means and why it is important to test for it. Um, I'm going to skip playing this actual video for you, but I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story that uh, happened about 45 minutes east of me in a little town called Shelbyville, Indiana. <laughs> and this is the story of Kathy. Uh, Kathy had a nice little house out in Shelbyville. It's a nice little rural uh, Indiana town. And Kathy started getting sick. And for 10 years, Kathy went to the doctor, and the doctors couldn't figure out what was going on with her. They did all sorts of testing. She took all sorts of medications. They went through just a whole gamut of tests. And they couldn't identify what was happening. Well, after about 10 years, and I don't know if you know what it feels like um, or you remember, but the flu, it's not a fun thing. That's what the doctors just kind of were like, oh, you have the chronic flu. Well, Kathy decided that she wanted to get her house remodeled. So she wanted to get specifically her bathroom because, you know, when you feel achy and sore and just, you know, ick, a nice hot bath sounds really good. Well, what wound up happening is Kathy hired some contractors and they went into her house and they started to remodel the bathroom and they opened up one of the closets and in lies the hot water heater. Well, they asked her, hey, Kathy, how long have you had this hot water heater? And she goes, oh, about 10 years. And some light bulbs started going off. And those light bulbs were, as they started looking at the ductwork, that whoever had installed that hot water heater had installed it improperly. The venting wasn't right on it. It was a real special job. And what was happening is Kathy didn't have the flu. What Kathy had was carbon monoxide poisoning. And what was happening is it was kicking all that CO back into her house and giving her low levels. And you might start asking yourself, well, did she have a home CO detector? And the answer to that is yes. But here's the problem. If you haven't picked up a home CO detector and looked at the back of it, um, most of those at minimum are 40 minutes before they start reading. And it can take several hours of sustained high levels of carbon monoxide. Now, if you think about that hot water heater that you may have in your house, it's not constantly running. So you're going to get ebbs and flows of the CO going on. And that's exactly what was happening to Kathy. And CO is a very, very nasty thing because carbon monoxide builds up into your system. So um, I want to make some distinctions here for you. Uh, carbon monoxide, uh, also abbreviated CO, um, it does get confused with CO2. So um, when somebody's asking you about some sort of detector or saying that they're having an issue, make sure that we're clarifying if it's carbon monoxide which is very dangerous and deadly, or carbon dioxide, which still can cause you problems, um, but it's not going to be as lethal as carbon monoxide. So carbon monoxide, it's created from incomplete combustion. It's tasteless, colorless, and odorless. It can be fatal, and whenever, ever you walk into some place and you're seeing CO levels, you need to figure out why. So, can you measure carbon monoxide? Absolutely. If you measure carbon monoxide, is it safe to leave the appliance or the combustion system running, so your furnace or your boiler? Um, have you provided the homeowner or workplace employee enough information to alert them of any hazards that might be present? And the most important thing is, is if you leave that area and you see CO, would you consider that area safe for your family members that you love or for coworkers to live or work in that building. 
So I personally like to have things that let me know and like little things that remind me um, of what what the signs of carbon monoxide poisoning are. So um, if you met me, you'd know, is it signs of a good night out or is it carbon monoxide poisoning? Because they can vary, uh, they mimic each other a lot, right? You can have headaches, nauseousness, breathlessness, collapse, dizziness, and, you know, loss of consciousness or in worst case scenarios, actual death. So as I talked about that first line right there in small doses, it can create chronic illness. That's exactly what happened to uh, my friend Kathy out there in Shelbyville. Um, contractors are going into all sorts of places. I've, I've heard the horror stories in my travels across the country um, that you don't know what somebody else has done before you. And so if you don't test, you'll never really be sure if there's CO there. Um, and then the other important thing is anything that is testing carbon monoxide should be calibrated regularly. And that's to ensure reliability because we wanna make sure if it's, it's, it's testing a get deadly gas that it is spot on where it needs to be. So measuring carbon monoxide. Um, I don't know if you guys know what all the levels are uh, for carbon monoxide, what is, um, what are the legal limits and everything like that. But uh, if you could just picture a pile of 1 million baseballs, and that would pretty much take up that entire field if you were to just lay them all out. And now only nine of them are painted red. And that's how small of a dose of carbon monoxide that can start making you feel um, feel ill after prolonged times. <clears throat> so ASHRAE had standards, always check with your local municipalities as well. Um, different states um, and different cities and all of that type of stuff have different, um, different regulations. Um, ASHRAE's recommendation is um, a residential house, a facility can't have more than nine parts per million. So right, just nine of those baseballs out there on the field. If you're in a workplace, you can't exceed over 35 parts per million for a continuous eight hour period. Um, and I know that we're all going in and out. We work in places that have docks. I don't know if you guys specifically use anything like um, propane uh, forklifts and those type of things, but you wanna make sure that you're cracking some doors even when it's super cold outside or super hot because that carbon monoxide can build up and start making you feel a little bit ill. Um, and anything over 35 parts per million is considered unsafe and you should evacuate that area immediately. Um, and that, uh, unfortunately, I've seen it in warehouses, so please, please be safe while you guys are out there. Um, <clears throat> I wanna talk a little bit about sources of CO that contractors are, are generally going to see. Um, auto exhaust accounts for about 60% of your alarms. Um, if you've ever, you know, you have your car, you start it up, uh, it tapers off, but when a car starts up, it can shoot out over 12,000 parts per million of CO. Um, and if that were to have been prolonged, it would be very deadly and very quick for you. One of the things that I think we all talk a lot about is how tight are we building those houses? Um, you know, everything, the, all the new standards, you wanna make sure you don't you have your cracks, you don't have this. Um, but sometimes those cracks actually have some benefits in them because they're allowing some of that um, stale inside air and some of that fresh outside air to actually traverse actually throughout, the throughout the house. Throughout the house. Um, so as we're seeing houses being t uh, built uh, much more tightly, uh, somebody pulls in their car into the garage, they shut the garage door, they immediately open the door to the house. All of that CO is getting poured into the house because of the pressure that's going on. Um, you know, as I said earlier, most CRO alarms designed to start going off at 70 parts per million. And uh, I've seen some newer ones where it's only 40 minutes, but I've seen others where it's up to two hours of that alarm going on um, or sustained levels before you can um, hear that alarm going off. So, you know, also winter time um, is a really good thing to think about. A lot of people, you know, you don't want your car to be cold. I've seen it too often where somebody is getting ready to leave somewhere, they start their car, they let it run, and they forgot to um, 
actually a crack the garage door or a window or something in there and all that CO when they open the door is just just pouring into the house the garage is filled with it and you won't necessarily know because as I said earlier it is colorless tasteless and odorless so another popular source of CO that you see in houses is actually backdrafting appliances and that was the story that we started with right that hot water heater um, it was invented properly um, and all that CO was just pouring back into poor Kathy's house. Um, another fun thing that um, likes to happen, I'm going to guess it happens up there in the Northeast just like it happens here to me in Indiana. Um, but you know, contractor goes in, does the clean and check, everything's great, all of those type of things. Then all of a sudden we get a heat spell, nobody's um, nobody's running their heat and in the meantime a squirrel or a bird decided that it was a really nice place for them to be able to uh, to make a house um, and you know those the squirrel nests can be just absolutely vicious um, and then suddenly it gets cold again homeowner turns on uh, the furnace or the boiler and all of a sudden their CO just pouring back into the house because that that flue or chimney is blocked um, one of the one of the top things that I see uh, being uh, in the backdrafting appliances is uh, gas water heaters um, and those on-demand uh, water heaters we're seeing a lot more of those getting installed and they can be if not installed properly a huge source of CO going on so the other thing that I want to talk about that's specific to the HVAC world in carbon monoxide um, is cracked heat exchangers um, you know, I know there's a lot of methods that I've heard guys talk about that they use to diagnose if a heat exchanger is cracked. Um, it doesn't happen a whole lot. It's not uh, one of the major sources of just CO in a house. Um, it accounts for about less than 10% of um, CO alarms going off in a house. Um, but if you're not checking for it and you're not uh, doing that when you're doing your clean and checks, um, you're exposing yourself to a whole lot of liability. Um, there's definitely things that you want to start looking for when you're doing it. You want to look for the visual signs, uh, like if you have soot or rust. Um, and, you know, we'll talk about at the end of this, one of our tools that's very specific that has a heat exchanger integrity test. Um, so you can actually do the pre and post testing on it uh, to ensure that there isn't a cracked heat exchanger. Uh, here's a couple of real life photos of what can happen um, if you have a cracked heat exchanger. Uh, take a look at that wall, looks pretty awful. You can see the soot all over it. Um, if you look down by the door um, and you start seeing some dust deposits going around it, um, it can be a very good indication that the structure is under pressure. Um, looking at those flue pipes, right? Like rusting going on. Um, you want to get those changed out because we all know what uh, what happens with rust. Eventually it eats through and it's going to allow all of that CO that should be getting vented right out of the house um, to start exposing itself within the house. Um, and then you also just want to make sure that that ductwork, um, if it's old and you see visual openings um, or you're seeing leak points that you're getting that replaced because once again that's just going to let all of that CO uh, go right out. So why test? Uh, there's a variety of reasons to test and I think it's really important to talk about those. Uh, so one of the one of the first things right that we all want to worry about is fuel cost. So 80% furnace, 20% 20, uh, 20 of everything's getting um, of all of the fuel is getting lost. Um, and you don't necessarily know how efficient that boiler or furnace may be running. Um, so, you know, if you have an old 80 percenter, maybe it's only running at 70 percent uh, and those type of things. Uh, the other thing that we're all concerned about is we want to manage the emissions into the environment. Uh, we're very lucky that when, <clears throat> when, when you're testing, you see high levels and then it gets uh, diluted into the ambient air. Um, but the very last thing is we really want to also minimize the risk of CO poisoning uh, because it can be fatal to you, the contractors, and the homeowners. Um, and I think uh, everybody's pretty aware right now that we live in a world where you want to make sure that you've dotted all your I's and crossed all your T's. And when you leave that job, that you feel good, that you did the right, 
right thing. Everything is where it needs to be. <clears throat> so one of the other things that I like to ask um, when I'm in my class, uh, when I'm teaching my class is um, how many contractors, how many HVAC contractors got into the HVAC world because they love to sell? And I can't tell you how many times I've taught this class and I've yet to have some one of our contractors actually say, you know what, that's that's the number one reason I got into this is because I love to sell things. Um, if you have the right tools, it makes that selling portion of things so easy. A lot of our contractors are small companies and, you know, they ha they have to the contractor is also the, the salesperson. Right. Mrs. Smith, you know what, your your boiler. It had a nice life, but we need to be able to change that out. Um, we're going to give you the tools that are going to be able to document that. So Mrs. Smith no longer has to just say, oh, Bob said I need a new one. And but Google says um, he's going to be able to provide concrete evidence. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, towards the end of it. So we talked about CO and what it is. It's a, it's a byproduct of anything burning. Right. So you have to have you have to have fuel, you have to have oxygen um, and you have to have uh, a fire. So what's really nice is if you know this is what we call the combustion scale uh, and it can look a little bit goofy at first. But what basically you can take from this is the fact that if you know two points, so if you know what the CO and the CO2 levels are, you can actually calculate out those oxygen levels. So if you have a system that maybe it's a little bit too fuel rich, that means you're not getting enough oxygen. Um, you're going to wind up with a lot of extra unburned fuel. Uh, and you're also going to wind up with large amounts of CO uh, being, being created. Uh, if you wind up with something that's too air rich, um, you're going to wind up with a lot of the heat going up the flue and you're going to waste a lot of fuel. Um, you're going to see that you're also going to have high levels of oxygen and low levels of CO going on. And then kind of on the top, uh, there's a little spot that is the sweet spot. Um, I wish everything could be theoretical combustion and we'll show what that looks like. Um, but that means that no fuel is wasted and it is all burnt up. Um, but mainly we work in the real world, so we're going to hope for ideal combustion. So you're going to wind up with minimal amounts of oxygen and carbon monoxide um, in that mix, and it's going to be mainly that CO2. So if you can remember back to your high school chemistry class, uh, I know that can be a little bit of a stretch. I barely remember mine. Uh, but this is a nice little chart that kind of shows what complete combustion is. And if you notice on the left hand side, um, you have your hydrogen and your carbon and your oxygen um, and everything's all nice and neatly paired. And then combustion happens and you look on the right side and everything once again is very nicely paired, right? Everything is all lined up. It looks nice and pretty. But this is what happens when you wind up with incomplete combustion. So you see your hydrogen and your carbon, your oxygen, <clears throat> and then you go to the other side. And I think our contractors should be aware that you wind up with uh, some some H2O, i.e. water. Uh, you wind up with some hydrogen and suddenly things have paired up and now you have that carbon monoxide going on. Um, so we want to be able to minimize that amount of carbon monoxide. Um, how to measure. And I know this is um, a lot of what we wanted to talk about is um, how to measure flue gases. And honestly, it's it's a pretty simple simple thing to be able to do once you've done it. Um, it, it's, it just gets easier every time you've done it. Um, I didn't talk a little bit about my background before I got in here, but I did tell you I've been with UEI for about five years. If you would have told me five years ago that um, I would be teaching classes like this, or if you would have told Louise 10 years ago she'd be teaching classes like this, she would have probably laughed at you and said, there's no way. Um, but I can do it. Um, I've actually been able to go out with some contractors. I've been at um, wholesalers over here in the Midwest um, and we've gotten to do some of the live fire demos. So my general rule of thumb is if Louise can do it, I know you can do it. Um, so it's a really simple um, process to measure. 
Um, we talked about everything that needs to happen. You need to figure out the amount of oxygen left, CO2 created, CO. Um, some places are starting to really uh, regulate the, uh, the NOx emissions as well. Um, but when you know all of those things, um, coupled with the fuel type and the temperature of the combustion air, um, you're going to be able to figure out that efficiency. So, um, and I have some pictures that we'll, we'll come up to here. Uh, normally I have a, a combustion analyzer actually in my hand that we'll be able to, to show you, but uh, in these strange times, we do the best that we can. Um, but there is a nice little probe, and um, depending on if you're doing boilers or furnaces, uh, there's a lot of new boilers who actually have a testing port already built into them. Um, but if you're not uh, that lucky, um, all you have to do is drill about a quarter inch of a hole into the flue pipe. And you're going to do that above the boiler um, or furnace, but before any of the draft inducers. And that's kind of where that sweet spot is. Um, and then you're going to take the flue probe and you're going to line it up so the tip of it is in the center of the flue probe. And then the analyzer just takes over for you. It starts showing you all of the results. One of the nice things that we do uh, is in our manuals. It actually shows you all the possibilities of places that you can test. Um, so, you know, we talk a lot about boilers and furnaces because we're in the HVAC world, um, but there are also a lot of other places. Those hot water heaters that we mentioned, um, you know, I've seen it where you can even do testing on ovens to see if you have uh, CO leaks as well. Um, so checking out that manual, which is also available to download on our website. Um, but I think these where to test images are just fantastic because it's showing you exactly where you need to put your flu probes and the uh, the values that the not necessarily the values because every manufacturer is different, but it's going to tell you um, what you're looking for, right? Is this an area that you're just checking temperature? Are you checking the pressure across the coils? Those type of things. Um, so I definitely recommend checking out that manual on where to test. Um, so we want to talk about what are the results after you've done all of that testing. So. The general rule of thumb for carbon monoxide going out the flue was actually 100 parts per million. Then on-demand hot water heaters came out and they started putting out uh, upwards of 150 plus. Um, so you always want to uh, check what the specs are for the manufacturer um, because it can vary on the size of the boiler and the type of fuel that you're using. Um, you know, I know uh, in the Northeast, um, I still see a lot of oil um, kits and uh, combustion analyzers that have been used. So, you know, you just got to make sure you have it set on the, the right fuel and you want to make sure that um, that you're following whatever the manufacturer specs are. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it goes out the flue and with the proper draft, that CO is going to quickly dissipate out into the air. The other thing that we really want to talk about is that carbon dioxide. You remember I said that it wasn't necessarily as deadly, um, but it definitely can cause you some issues um, because what CO2 does is it actually displaces the oxygen in the air, um, which can make it much harder for people to be able to breathe. Um, you know, that's that photosynthesis. If once again, going back to our, our high school uh, science classes, um, that's why trees are so important to our lives, right? Because trees absorb that CO2 and then they put out the oxygen so we can breathe a lot easier. The other thing about CO2, and it, especially if you're doing a lot of boiler installs that I want to mention, is um, a lot of the boiler manufacturers are actually not paying attention to what the CO and the oxygen levels are, but they're actually wanting to know what the CO2 levels are. Um, I got to do some training classes with various boiler companies, and one of the interesting things were um, that we had a conversation about is if the gas pressure was right and the CO2 levels were right, um, then everything was set up because that's how they're determining their efficiency. Uh, once again, always important to read the manuals of what you're doing um, and figure out what the uh, direct manufacturer specs are. And we'll talk a little bit about that CO2 reading at the end when I show you the different versions of combustion analyzers. 
Um, so one of the other things, there's a lot of results that print out um, when you get the kit version um, of our combustion analyzers or that you'll be able to see on your screen. Um, but the net temperature um, is a very important thing and you want to make sure that you're doing that. Um, the most accurate efficiency readings are when your, your net temperature is at the highest point. Um, so you want to make sure that, you know, things have, have regulated out within that um, to be able to get that. So every manufacturer uh, determines their boiler efficiency. We talked about 80% boilers mean that 20% of the fuel is wasted. Um, and <clears throat> the other important thing to remember is don't go chasing the efficiency. Um, I've seen too many contractors who are like, oh, if I, can't, if I uh, crank up the gas pressure here, um, you know, I'm getting 83%, which, you know, in theory sounds fantastic, but now you've taken that unit outside of the manufacturer specs of um, gas pressure, and that can lead to a whole lot of other issues for them. Um, so our combustion analyzers provide you, when you have the printer option, um, provide you with a lot of different tests that you can do, right? So if you kind of take a quick look there, uh, there's a combustion test, there's a uh, boiler commissioning test. If you just are checking and want some documentation of your pressure and temperature, um, you can have a report that does that. You see that there's a heat exchanger test uh, that one of our combustion analyzers do. Um, and then there's just kind of an auxiliary one that's just going to show you all of your current values. So I promised in this presentation that we would talk about the actual testing. Uh, so this has some nice visuals going on here for us. Uh, one of the important things that we want to remember, so you got your combustion analyzer, you're ready to go out, everything like that. Um, you want to make sure that you start that combustion analyzer in fresh air. Um, and so that's going to be the ambient air, preferably not right by your tailpipe with your truck running. Um, but, you know, you're getting everything ready, turn on that analyzer, because what that analyzer is doing is it's taking its, its, its base levels right there. So um, you want to make sure that you're doing, turning it on outside in the fresh air. Uh, depending on which analyzer that you have from us, it can take anywhere from 60 to 90 seconds for that to warm up. Um, and then I talked earlier about um, there, there's a, a probe, and that probe has two parts to it. Um, so one of the parts of that is actually there's, there's a pressure hose that you're going to put into the port. Um, on, on the higher end models, that's what you'll see. You'll see that it'll have a, a P1 and P2, so you can do differential pressures. Uh, and then you're going to insert the probe. Uh, so that probe is going to go into what they call the water trap. And you remember that we talked a little bit about um, that H2O is a byproduct of the combustion um, in, in the combustion process. So you want to make sure that you plug that in there. And then there's going to be a K-type thermocouple um, that you're going to plug in into the T1 port. And it's important. I've seen it happen. Um, I haven't been able to quite do it, but you want to make sure that you're watching for the polarity. So uh, when, you, when you look at uh, that K-type thermocouple, make sure that the small end is getting plugged into the small hole and the big end is getting plugged into the big end um, and you don't want to force it. It should slide in easy if you have it ready to go. So now you remember I told you that you had to drill that little hole. Um, if it's a house you've been going to quite regularly, you may find that, you know, you've, you've covered up the hole and it makes life really easy um, because now you're going to be able to uh, just open up, back up that hole. You don't have to make the, the drill, um, but you're going to insert that probe into the stack or the flue. And then, you know what? Magic happens. Um, no, I kid, it's, it's not magic, it is very scientific, um, but you're going to start seeing your test results. And depending on what analyzer of ours you have, um, there may be uh, ones that just you have to scroll through to be able to see all of your res results. Some of them also have uh, flu one, flu two, uh, so you'll be able to toggle back and forth and see all of your results. Um, what's really nice about this is that not only you're seeing real-time readings of what's going on, uh, so we talked about adjusting the pressure at the gas valve, and that's a 
a really important thing, right? If the gas pressure isn't isn't proper, you're definitely not going to have an efficient boiler or furnace going on. Uh, with a combustion analyzer, um, especially our C165 that I'll show you in a minute, um, you're going to be able to not only see what your pressure readings are, you're going to be able to see the instantaneous results of what's going out the flue. Um, so you can make those adjustments, you can watch it, you don't have to unhook and rehook things. Um, one of the things that I really like about our um, combustion analyzers is we want to make it as user friendly uh, for a contractor as possible. Um, you know, the more things that you're trying to hold and juggle, it can be very, very difficult. Um, so we've added uh, magnetic boots um, or magnets built into things um, so you can put it up on the unit and begin doing um, be begin doing the testing. So you're still able to see your screen, um, but you don't have to hold the unit and try to hold that flu probe as well. Um, and as I said, there's printer options going on out there uh, because documentation is king. Anything that we can do to document what we've done is very important. Um, I'm just going to leave this slide up for a quick second. I told you that you can um, actually test ovens for CO leaks too. Um, because one of the things is, is you may be going in for a furnace or a boiler and you're seeing CO going on in the house. Um, and it may not necessarily um, be the, burn the, the boiler or the furnace. Um, it could be a dryer that's not done right. It could be a oven that isn't vented properly or those pesky water heaters once again. Um, so you want to make sure that you are aware of that. Um, <clears throat> I was pretty excited a couple of years ago. I got to visit one of our end user customers who is actually a large, um, large oven manufacturer and they use our combustion analyzers as part of their quality control process, which was, uh, which was pretty neat. So, you know, you may be focused on one thing uh, and find out that there's something else going on in the house. One of the important things that we've tried to do is we, we try to make your, your lives a little bit easier. And we've noticed that a lot of the heavy equipment manufacturers are starting to require startup sheets being filled out. Uh, so this is um, a sample one uh, from one of the boiler companies out there. Um, and these are all the values that they're asking for. And they want these values to be filled out because of warranty issues. Uh, no longer are we in the day of you've installed the boiler, you look at the flame, something goes, you think the flame looks right, something goes awry, it's not working right, you call the manufacturer and you say, hey, this, this isn't right, um, you know, I want to claim warranty on this, well, they're going to ask you first question, what was the gas pressure? And they're not going to accept the answer, it's right. They're going to want actual values. Uh, so what we've been able to do is to take those manufacturer startup sheets and then we've added the tools that you need to be able to do the job properly. Um, so this is a really nice one. Um, they do a, a really great job of clear and concise of what they're looking for. Um, you know, I talked about that they want to know what the CO2 values are. They actually do want to see the CO values. Um, you know, they want to know what is that amp draw going on. Um, and then the other thing, I don't know if it's uh, as, as popular out in the, the eastern region, um, but there's a lot of uh, conversation about the static pressure, right, within the ductwork. Is it is everything venting properly? Is the ductwork pro uh, properly sized? Those type of things. Um, so we can also customize these um, to whatever uh, brand you may be installing um, or stocking. Uh, it's, it, we have a lot of them ready to go, but if there's one that we've missed, let us know and we'll be happy to help you with that. So that is CO uh, and combustion and how to test. So hopefully you feel a little bit better about that. Uh, and now I want to get into the tool part, portion of it. And what tools do you need to be able to measure it? So that, that first conversation that we had was all about my buddy Kathy out there in Shelbyville. Remember, had the flu for the last 10 years. And I would like to think that most homeowners are diligent enough. And, you know, at minimum, they're having a contractor come out at least once a year to do a clean and check on their furnaces. 
had any one of those contractors walked into our house with one of our handheld portable CO detectors, they would have instantly realized that there was a problem and maybe Kathy wouldn't have had to been sick for the last 10 years. So we offer uh, two different CO detectors for you. Um, what's really nice about these, you can throw them on your bag, start them up at the beginning of the day, throw them on your bag, everywhere you walk into, uh, you're gonna be able to see if you have CO levels going on. <coughs> So what I like about this one, it's a nice screen, has a nice little backlight on it. Up there on the top, you may see that there's a little light going on, um, or at least the spot for the light. Um, it's not only gonna give you an audible sound, but it's gonna give you a visual key too. And um, I think that's really important. Um, and here, here's a little story that I, that came from my, my personal life in a, in a life long before UEI, but I worked in retail and I worked in a, a very uh, large uh, two-story big box store. And I was a, a supervisor there. And we had a very, very old boiler and chiller system in that place. And in the summer, as we all know, it gets hot and humid out here our chiller would go out. And so one of the things that we had to do on the management team was we actually had to go and restart it. Um, in hindsight, probably not the best people and they should have invested a lot of money in that. But um, I remember the first day that I was told that I had to go restart it, one of my coworkers grabbed me and said, hey, we got to go up to the penthouse. And my eyes got really big and I was like, what, we have a penthouse? And, you know, in my mind, uh, not being from an HVAC world, a penthouse meant that it was this really plush luxury, you know, like I pictured that this is why I could never find a manager when I was out on the floor because they had these nice recliner chairs and probably had a big screen TV up there and a little cooler with some cool beverages and whatnot. Um, so I'm like, what? So we run up there. And it turns out that my impression of what a penthouse is, is very, very different than what that version of a penthouse was. And I know you all have the uh, luxury right now that you can change the volume on your computer. Uh, and you may have found that maybe you've had to turn me down a little bit because one of the things that people never say about Louise is I can't hear you. Um, and I remember we were standing up in this penthouse and the unit was going on and I leaned over to say something and she's giving me the visual symbol, like signals that she can't hear me. And that's a reality for our contractors. They're often going into places where it's not easy to be able to hear. And that's why those visual alarms are so important for them. They may not hear a beeping, but they're gonna see a red light. They're gonna see the yellow light. They're going to see that. So this is a standalone unit that they're gonna be able to use. And then we found out that there's a lot of people out there, the technology that we wanna talk about. And so we have this standalone unit, which has the nice audio and visual cues. Um, and all it's gonna do is alert you if they're CO. Uh, but you know, technology changes and people want more things out of their tools. Uh, so what was really nice about this one is this is our, our newer COA2, and it's combined the technology camp along with those who like the standalone units. Uh, so if you notice, it has a little bit of a bigger display. Um, it does have a clip on the back, so once again, you can still attach it um, to a bag or to, to yourself, whatever you need to do um, to be able to see it. Um, but it'll also Bluetooth to your phone. And once you've added that Bluetooth capability with it, it's gonna allow you to log, store, and record all of your results. Um, so, you know, you could put it down in the middle of the room, you know, you're going to do your clean and check, um, and you're gonna be able to see if there were any CO spikes uh, while you were doing something else, which is really nice. Um, so it has a nice big display. <clears throat> and um, once again, the three color warning alert for you and the audible alert. Um, so I want to make you aware of both of those. Now, let's get into the combustion analyzers, which is really my favorite portion of things to talk about. And what's really neat about UEI uh, combustion analyzers, is, um, if you aren't completely familiar with how that technology works, 
Uh, we talked about the fact that there's a lot of values that you need to uh, know to determine efficiency, and I showed you that combustion scale earlier and said if you know two of the values, you can extrapolate out the third. So there's been a, a consistent issue that has happened across the industry with combustion analyzers. And there's a challenge because a traditional combustion analyzer is going to have oxygen and CO sensors. And what happens is what are we breathing in the air? Well, the answer is we're breathing oxygen. So if you have a sensor that is designed to breathe oxygen, it's going to constantly be breathing oxygen. And that also means that it becomes a problem because how do you know when that sensor is going to die? You don't know. You don't know how long ago that CO2 sensor was manufactured. You don't know how long it was sitting in a warehouse or put on a shelf. Um, or maybe, you know, you've put it away for the season and it's highly possible you're going to wind up with an O2 sensor that has, has died. And I don't know if you've priced out the cost of oxygen sensors, but they add up pretty quickly for something that, you know, even, even our best guesses can be wrong on the lifetime of that. So UEI decided, hey, there's got to be a better way to do this, right? Um, once again, you need two values. You can extrapolate out the third one. So UEI's engineers, who are way smarter than I am, came up with this idea, and it's called our EOS technology which is our electrical optical sensor. And what that does is it gives you a direct reading of the CO, and then it takes the, the rest of the gases and it passes it through a little bit of an IR bench um, and gives you your CO2 reading, and then it calculates out the oxygen. And now what that has allowed us to do is it has, it's allowed us to have an analyzer that's not going to just randomly die on you, uh, but it's also um, allowed us to mean that it's a lower cost of ownership. You know, I, I think that is an important factor when we're buying things. It's an, a factor, um, even think about it when you're buying a car, right? So you, 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 maybe you're buying a used car and you have it narrowed down to two. You're going to kind of look at it and you're going to decide, okay, well, I want this for the long haul. What one's going to be easier for me to maintain? Well, not having that oxygen sensor, we're able to lower your cost of ownership you no longer have the fear of that oxygen sensor dying. And one of the other really nice things um, about UEI test instruments, um, I'm based in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, so, you know, depending on, on which state you're at, you're, you're probably one to two days shipping from me. Uh, but we've, we've looked at what makes it really important to our customers. What, what are they looking for? And they're looking for flat rate pricing. So they know what, what it's going to cost them before they ever send it in. They're looking at what is, what's the turnaround time? Uh, we, have, we have worked very hard and succeeded at making our turnaround time two days. So it lands in our lab on a Monday. It's going out on a Wednesday. Um, that, that's huge, right? Because I would like to think that every one of our contractors out there, right, you guys are sending them in in the middle of July when you think you don't need to be using them. Uh, and unfortunately, that's not the case. Uh, we see the bulk majority just in time for the season. Um, so that two-day turnaround time that we've been able to maintain even during the busy season is huge. Um, we want to make sure because time is money. If you're out of your tool, that's a huge huge deal. So let's talk about our actual combustion analyzers. Uh, so this is our C165 kit that you see there. Um, so if you see it has a nice handheld unit, it, um, it does come with some replug, uh, rechargeable batteries in it. It comes with uh, two thermocouples because you're able to do um, differential temperature. Um, it comes with all of the tubing, so you can actually do all of your pressure tests, um, including um, not only your gas pressures, but you'd be able to do your static pressures and the ductwork with that as well. Uh, the C165 is a really neat unit, um, and my favorite feature on it is actually the CO purge pump, um, especially if you're working on boilers. Uh, all too often, I've, I've heard calls of somebody who has hammered a CO sensor. Uh, one, they've decided that they weren't sure if it was working, so they decided to put it in the tailpipe of their car, and 
remember we talked about the startup of that, it could be up to 12,000 parts per million, um, which is way exceeds any um, or most CO sensors out there on the market. Um, but we actually put in a CO purge pump. And what that CO purge pump allows us to do is when it sees high levels of CO, it shuts off the main pump and it turns on a secondary pump that pushes all of that CO out of the unit. Um, that way it's never touching that CO. And you remember I talked about um, oxygen sensors can get expensive to replace. Uh, well, CO sensors can also get expensive. So we've now effectively removed the possibility of two sensors going bad for the guy because we don't have an oxygen sensor and we put in that CO purge pump. One of the other really nice features on there when we were looking at all the different um, tests that we could do, I mentioned that there's a boiler commissioning test. And that boiler commissioning test is really, it's a pre and post test um, and it walks you through it step by step. Uh, that commissioning test, it's, it's very popular in the UK, but it actually follows the exact same startups um, that boiler manufacturers are asking you to do. And I like it because it tells you step by step. It tells you, you know, insert the flu probe, hit enter. Uh, it says wait until it steadies out, hit enter. And it, it walks you through every single section for it. Um, the other thing, if you don't have an ambient room CO tester, um, that CO A1, or I'm sorry, the CO 71A or the CO A2, this actually has an ambient room CO test that you can put it on, um, which will take a sample every two minutes for 30 minutes. Um, so you effectively get 15 minute or 15 um, data points that you're going to be able to see if there's CO going on between it. <clears throat> So it's easy to use. Here's a little bit of a closer picture on it. It has that nice kind of multimeter style dial, uh, which allows you to toggle back and forth through the different tests very easily. We've made it a nice six line display, so you're able to see more of what you're looking for in one place. It has the differential temperature, the differential pressure, um, a backlight, that rubberized boot, um, magnetic and you can actually customize your auxiliary screen um, so if there's very specific things that you know that you're always looking for um, you can customize that um, <clears throat> as I said these are the the tests that it'll do that CO room test the boiler commissioning test and that um, carbon monoxide overrange pump which I just I, I can't tell you enough about how life-saving um, and time saving and uh, unit saving that has been for our contractors. Um, the manual, um, I, I'd like to think that everybody takes the manual out and you read it front to back, um, but you know there's a few things that I have learned and that's usually not the case, um, but I do encourage uh, looking through it because it's going to give you some really important things. Um, that little diagram that I showed you earlier on where to test, um, it's actually going to give you the formulated, uh, the formulas for the calculated test results. Um, so I don't know, I'm going to guess everybody here in this room remembers exactly what the efficiency uh, formula is. Um, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, I can't even remember exactly what it is and I talk about it uh, fairly regularly. Um, but if you did ever want to see what the actual formula is, it's in there. Um, it talks about how to maintain and protect your instruments. Uh, it talks about the different steps for conducting specific tests, and it talks about the explanations. So a lot of the things that you saw in this presentation are going to be included in that manual for you. Um, so, you know, I do encourage taking a look at that. Um, and as I said, all of our combustion analyzers, um, anything that's reading CO, and that's what a combustion analyzer does, um, should be sent in to get uh, serviced once a year um, on our on our calibration and everything like that and that's where that two-day turnaround comes from. Now the next thing that we want to talk about so that C165 it comes with the printer it comes with all the hoses it comes with everything that you can pretty much ever need for um, combustion training or combustion testing. What, what I've learned is, one, uh, especially with some of our smaller shops, right, it, it becomes an investment. Um, and if you're not used to doing it, um, it can be a little bit difficult to, to justify that. 
Uh, and so we came out with the C161, which is a fantastic product. It has a lot of the goodness of that C165 that we talked about. Um, it uses that EOS technology, so once again, you don't have to worry about an oxygen sensor going dead to you. Um, we kept a nice six-line display. If you notice it, uh, we've updated the look of it a little bit. This one looks a little bit more modern and sleeker, um, but it is uh, it has a NOx-filtered CO sensor, um, and it tells you when your water trap's getting ready to get full. Um, but the, the C161, it's an analyzer. Uh, that's all it is. So it is an analyzer, a probe, and a box, but it's priced right. And it's still going to give you all of the goodness that you need to be able to get. Um, it's going to give you your efficiencies. It's going to give you um, your differential temperature. Um, you do not get pressure in this particular one. Um, it does have a printer port, so um, you can purchase a printer separately. Uh, it comes with eight pre-programmed -pre fuels and that magnetic pump. Um, and the C161 and the C165 both do that auto purge uh, at the shutdown, so you never have to worry about gases just hanging out on the sensor for you. Um, so the C161, uh, just to kind of give you an idea, um, I know that I am talking to, I think, a lot of people from within Granite at the moment, um, but and I'd like to think that you also remember every single thing that I've said today. Um, once again, I, I've learned that you know we, we're human and we can only remember so much. So we've really tried to, to make this easy for you guys with that C161 packaging. Um, all of those good points that I just talked about are actually on the packaging. Uh, so it's going to tell you about the um, no O2 sensor. It's going to talk about the technology. It's going to highlight um, the top features in it, which make it very easy for you. Um, and we highly recommend that you um, you register the product after you pur purchased it. Um, it's going to eventually help us help remind you uh, when when you need to send it in. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about that recertification process. I get to work very closely with our guys in the lab. Um, those guys in the lab work their butts off to maintain that two-day turnaround time. Um, and that that's impressive um, because if you saw everything that they have to do on it, uh, it's a 30-plus a point inspection that they do. Um, if anything's changed or we needed to um, modify something, we can do all the firmware and software updates. Um, you pay for it to get to us and we pay for it to get back to you. Um, and then the other important thing, though, is actually uh, how the warranty process works. So every unit comes with a one-year warranty that you can extend out to up to six years um, just by simply having it serviced every year. And I don't know about you guys, but I would love that my car warranty got extended and all I had to do was do the oil change. Uh, so that's kind of how I like to think about it. Um, you know, we, we try to make ourselves as easy to work with and everything like that. Um, you know, we're always a phone call away. Um, we have customer service not only in the uh, Indianapolis facility, but out in our Beaverton, Oregon facility as well. Uh, Joan is always there for you guys if you have any questions, um, as well as I'm available for questions, but we do have a great tech support and everything like that. So. That being said, that is everything that I have on combustion, CO, um, and UEI products. Do we have any questions? <laughs>